Hey, mate, 40 here. So unlike you young blokes, when I do my pull-ups, I can really only do them every other day, right? I try to do them every day, and I'm just way too tired. I mean, I might not even be able to come all the way up with with one. But uh, I heard when you do the the pull-ups, it's good for your shoulders. My shoulders are really weak. Like when I do pull-ups or weights or anything or push-ups, I sense that I'm just doing it all with my arms rather than my shoulders. So someone told me the other day that if I work on the the pull-ups, that will strengthen the shoulders while the the chin-ups, that will strengthen the the biceps. So really trying to do more pull-ups. And today was uh, pull-up day. And so there's there's my favorite tree branch that I like to do my pull-ups on. But it was surrounded by stuff. Like someone was moving in or out of an apartment building. And I thought, you know, please God, let there be a little room for my my pull-ups. But even more challenging is that there were three teenage girls sitting on this stuff. Like right right before my my branch, my favorite branch to do pull-ups. So I would not be dissuaded, right? I I got out there, you know, jumped on the branch and started doing pull-ups. And these Sheilas, I would not be... They were laughing. They were laughing at me. Like I'm struggling to do three pull-ups and they're laughing at me. And at the same time, I'm trying to carry on a conversation with, with a friend. And uh, you know, I do my, my three pull-ups, uh, walk away for a minute, and they're just cackling and laughing. And when I, I turn around to come back to the, the tree branch, they have moved over to another tree and they're trying to do pull-ups themselves, but they can't do any. Right, so they're like trying to boost each other up to be able to do a pull-up. But they're all cackling and laughing and having a good old time. And I'm just like back to, you know, grim old duty, you know, do another three. But the last one is only 80% true, you know, trying to carry on a conversation. And they're probably wondering, like, who's this creepy old dude, you know, trying to like show off by doing pull-ups in front of us. But no, they they became fully absorbed with their own project of, of trying to do pull-ups. They were just giggling and laughing and boosting each other up, up the, the tree. But uh, it's kind of... T- touches on like a wee bit of an issue for me. So I remember once I went to an engagement party and I saw that these young women at this engagement party, when they would spot each other across the room, they would squeal and they'd run towards each other and they'd like leap into each other's arms. And I, the next day I went to therapy and I talked about, you know, how stupid these young women were squealing and whooping and falling into each other's arms And uh, my therapist said, well, probably you wish that you could squeal and and whoop. You wish that someone would squeal for joy to see you. You wish that you could be, you know, included in their reindeer games. But Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer doesn't get to be included in the, you know, all sorts of normal forms of human connection are just a foreign language to me. I think it's from growing up in in foster care, uh, like, you know, seeing these three girls just like giggling and laughing and having a great time together. And I'm having kind of this grim uh, solo experience, just me and the bloody tree branch. And it just reflects, I got this tiny wee bit of an issue with, with loneliness. And I, I don't think it's an unfamiliar problem for, for bachelors. And I've just been pierced by this C.S. Lewis quote that I, I read a few days ago. The price for freedom is loneliness. Happiness comes from being tied. Like, ouch. So I, I spent five of the last 18 months, you know, walking around Australia, most of that time in Sydney, perhaps the most beautiful city in the world. And I would typically spend all day walking 10, 12, 15, up to 20 miles around the gorgeous Sydney Harbour. But 95, 98% of my walks were on my own. And so who could I share them with? Well, the, the painful truth is I was sharing them with you. Like I'd, I'd make videos to, to feel less lonely as I was wandering around Sydney. I mean, how many, you know, 57-year-old dudes get to go to Sydney and just walk around all day? So, yeah, I have this, this surfeit of freedom. I could take off right now, you know, go to Sydney. I've got enough savings to live comfortably for a year in, in Sydney. But the, the price of that tremendous amount of freedom that I have is, is loneliness and the solution to loneliness is not, you know, filling it with other people and connection so much as reconfiguring my, my inner architecture, right? You know, loneliness was 
a reaction that I learned from my early years. And until I have those corrective emotional experiences re- reconfigure my inner life, my, my soul, I can be around a whole bunch of people. I can be right in the middle of things and, and still still feel lonely. So the there's been quick solutions that I've found for loneliness, and that's borrowed functioning from other people, like getting a girlfriend, getting an obsession. You notice how I'm always hopping from obsession to obsession, because when I get an intellectual obsession or a religious obsession, a you know recovery obsession, a diet and exercise obsession, whenever I get an obsession, it just kind of holds my, my loneliness at bay for a while. Or when I bring new people into my life or I have a relationship or I'm adopted into uh, semi-adopted into a family or you know, develop a new circle of friends or develop a new community or go join a cult or apprentice myself to some, you know, great guru, like, a, you know, a virtual guru like Dennis Prager or, you know, a real life guru like a rabbi that kind of keeps the, the loneliness at bay for a while, but it keeps coming back until I reconfigure the inner architecture of my soul. And the most effective way that I found to do that is to develop self-respect from living a life that is akin to a symphony. So where the various parts of my life are not at war with each other, but rather they're, they're building on each other. So when I was writing on the pornography industry and also trying to make my way in Orthodox Judaism, right, those were two facets of my life that were very much at war with each other. And thank God I don't have that anymore. I've reconfigured my live streaming so that it is you know, more at ease with what I might encounter in the, the wider world when I go to synagogue, when I go to Starbucks, when I walk down the street, when I meet people in public places and they happen to see my you know, live stream or hear my podcast, that's not going to be at war with my well-being. So that means that I don't discuss edgy topics nearly as much as I did, that if I do touch on things that are edgy, I try to phrase things in a much more socially acceptable manner. So I've turned down my show you know, lost a lot of viewers because it's not as exciting, it's not as cutting edge, it's not as you know as edgy and deviant and, and you know off the beaten path as it used to be to try to keep my show more in line with what's you know for my overall you know social well-being. So trying to build self-respect throughout my life so that from the way I conduct myself with earning money, the way I conduct myself with with clients, the way I conduct myself at synagogue in my 12-step programs, socially with, with friends, uh, when I'm just alone, me and my computer, on my blog, on my live stream. I just want everything preferably working together, or at least if they aren't working together, you know, I would prefer that they're not at war with each other, that they're not kind of canceling each other out. Because I find when you know, my life is, is working and I, I respect what I'm, I'm doing, then... The loneliness doesn't get to me. The, the loneliness kind of gets to me when the self-hatred gets to me, and the self-hatred gets to me when I make bad decisions. If I eat too much, if I'm you know, socially inept, if I'm self-aggrandizing, if I'm pushing myself into conversations where I'm not wanted, if I'm you know, misreading the room, if I'm not taking other people into consideration, if I'm you know, falling out of touch with reality and then getting humiliated. So... Like, what if, what if I was spending my time, like, playing a video game, so I was, like, you know, number one in the world at a particular video game, and that made me feel happy, and perhaps it filled a hole in my soul and reduced the intensity of the, the loneliness? Is that, you know, a maladapted delusion? So my thinking is your delusions are maladapted delusions if they directly lead to humiliation from, you know, that delusion. So if you're really good at video games and that does not lead to humiliation in real life, then I don't think it's a maladaptive delusion. If you're really good at uh, tennis or Shakespeare or playing marbles or uh, performing the commandments of Orthodox Judaism or you're a lay leader in your church or you know, whatever it is, you're a leader in your, your business softball league, right? whatever you're doing that's providing you with you know, meaning and solace and makes you feel expert and great, right? If it's not accompanied by frequent bouts of absolute humiliation, then you're probably doing something right, right? You, you've probably, probably fallen on something that's adaptive. But I don't know about you, but I've spent so much of my life just trying to get rid of myself, just trying to run away from 
who I am. So early on, I wanted to be a Christian missionary because I kind of wanted to run away from just being a loser at school who occasionally peed himself. And then I tried to run away from myself. I had these delusions that I grew up to be a, a great uh, general or a great political leader. And then, yeah, the, the late starts are hurting 40s ratings on the East Coast. <laughs> That's true. And and then I tried to run away from it. I said, oh, I'll just become a great journalist. I'll become a TV sportscaster. I'll become the next Walter Cronkite. Uh, maybe I'll return to Australia, become a political leader. Maybe I'll become the editor of the Jewish Journal of Los Angeles. Maybe I'll become the editor of the Los Angeles Times. Maybe I'll become the mayor of Los Angeles. Maybe I'll become a U.S. senator from California. Maybe I'll start a you know, a nonprofit to you know, help people who struggle with the same things that, that, uh, that I struggle with. So I, I get you know, all these great plans and I you know, get excited about them and it kind of diminishes the loneliness and the, the sense of you know, failure and frustration with my life for a while. But then all these, these fixations, they, they always disappear and I, I'm left back on my own resources. And so if I'm living a life that's basically a symphony, which is what I feel right now. So I, I feel amazing right now. I didn't, didn't wake up until about 5.12 a.m. this morning. So it's only the second time in about six weeks that I managed to wake up after 5 a.m. So normally I'm wide awake and going at, at 3 a.m. Uh, but overall, I, I feel like my life's a symphony. I'm up at 3 a.m. I'm reading. I'm doing my exercises. I'm meditating prayer, uh, working, on, working on preparing for this show, writing blog posts, uh, earning good money during the day. I get to you know, hang out with you know, the beautiful people in Beverly Hills, come back, you know, maybe do, do a quick show here, uh, get on my exercise bike, lift some weights, and uh, maybe socialize. All right, overall, pretty, pretty good life. What I, I need to do is like that symphony thing. Like I want those various components of my life from what I'm eating, what I'm drinking, how I'm earning my money, you know, my prayer life, my meditation life, my you know, political life, my activist side, my social media side, right? my, my writing side, my scholarly side, my religious side, my community side, my recovery side. I just need them preferably working together, at least not at war with each other. So at various times in my life, I have had that sense of mastery and symphony that I feel like I have right now, but then one thing will go wrong. Yes. This, this live stream is a bittersweet symphony. <laughs> so I don't know if you felt, have you had times in your life, you felt like everything's working, like you're in flow, man. You're in that flow state by that guy with that unpronounceable unpron name and you're just flowing. And then one thing goes wrong and you completely lose the flow state. You, you might lose your job. You might lose your, your girlfriend. You might break your leg or your arm. You, uh, have you know a sudden fiscal crisis or a sudden health crisis you develop you know overwhelming dental pain or you get a job and so you're you're you know previously embarked on this tremendous program of self improvement you are exercising you're eating right you're reading books you're growing spiritually morally physically intellectually but then you go and get a darn job and now you're tired at the end of the day and you just don't have the time or the inclination to work out to read books to do all the self-improvement that you were doing before. And so that, that life that was a symphony, right? It's not just a bittersweet symphony. It's just not a symphony at all. Now you just work. And then to kind of fill the hole in your soul, you might uh, use pornography. You might drink a lot. You might, you know, eat to excess. You might spend a lot. You, you might take up gambling, right? And so we, we have a life that's a symphony. And then one thing goes wrong and we're just completely knocked you know, out of that symphony. So we need some, some path that enables us to, you know, get back on our feet and, you know, get the symphony going again, you know, restart Mr. Forty's opus, right? So I always dreamed about being a great uh, classical music conductor or composer, but somehow I ended up here, but this is Mr. Forty's opus and I'm conducting the, the, you know, the beautiful, Beautiful uh, lyrics coming from Glib Medley and the, the wonderful melodies coming from Esoteric and 
the 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 thrill of uh, doing a live stream with seven live viewers on YouTube right now. Whoa, four live viewers. My God, over on Rumble. I, I hope this doesn't go to my head and, and change me. One on live viewer on Facebook, zero live viewers on Twitter, and one live viewer right now on Odyssey. All right, we're going out live on all these platforms. But uh, at least with you know, what, 15 live viewers all together, I can, I can have a little intimation of, of being that uh, conductor. I remember once I was just jokingly you know, imitating a conductor uh, in front of this woman who was a real musician, like a real classical music uh, musician. And she started playing her instrument, you know, in alignment with my conducting directions. That was like an incredible rush. I didn't realize that these, these gestures that the conductors make have, have real meaning and that real serious musicians follow them and then perform in accordance. Like, what a high is that? Like, all, all the... I, I had a slight acquaintance with Herbert Blumstadt, the, the maestro of the San Francisco Symphony. He was a big admirer of my father. And so it, it seems like all the big symphony conductors, they live a long time. Can you imagine like how happiness inducing that would be to just stand up there and have your little baton and you know, wave your arms around and you know, have, have an entire orchestra of high IQ, you know, highly trained classical musicians follow you? My God, that, that, that'd be amazing. Anyway, uh, so I'm a much bigger fan of developing some kind of flexible symphony approach to life than goals, right? Because I, goals are great in, in moderation, but I'm not as big a fan of goals as many people are because I notice goals tend to narrow my focus, right? So I tend to have fewer options and I just kind of constrict when I have overwhelming, overpowering goals in my life. Also, for me, goals tempt me towards shortcuts. And this might be just me. Another thing that goals do is that they give me excuse to avoid, you know, other painful, more difficult, more challenging, more necessary things that I need to work on that I don't really want to look at because I'm just so focused on my goals. And my goal might be to develop my live stream or to make more friends or to contribute more to my religious community or to the recovery community or to write a book. Uh, you know, I have all these different goals, but they narrow my focus. And so like, if you're watching this, you're probably, you know, an insecure person like myself, uh, someone for whom human connection is a significant part of the time, you know, a, a foreign language and, you know, somewhat disconnected from the normal, normal stream of life. And so if you're like me and you seize passionately and enthusiastically upon a goal, I want to be, for so many years of my life, it was really, really important to me to be Dennis Prager's number one disciple. I, I wanted to, I wanted to be you know, a servant to the leader of the band, right? That's like, that's where I got, a great deal of my meaning from about, I don't know, 1988 until about 1997. Like, I was like an only child, you know, alone and wild. Uh, I was just a theologian son. Now, my hands were meant for different work and my heart was known to none, right? I left my home and I went my alone and solitary way. And Dennis Prager, he gave to me a gift I know I can never repay. I mean, Prager's a quiet man of music, denied a simpler fate. He tried to be a soldier once, but his music wouldn't wait. He earned his love through discipline, a thundering velvet hand. His gentle means of sculpting souls took me years to understand. But now the leader of the band is 75, and his eyes are growing told. But his blood runs through my instrument, and his song is in my soul. My life has been a poor attempt to imitate the man. I'm just a living legacy to the leader of the band. My brother's lies were different, for they heard another call. One went to Chicago and the other to St. Paul. And I'm in Colorado when I'm in, not in some hotel, living out this life I've chose and come to know so well. Dennis, I thank you for the music and your stories of the road 
I thank you for the freedom when it came my time to go. I thank you for the kindness and the times when you got tough. Dennis, I don't think I said I love you near enough. Well, the leader of the band is tired and his eyes are growing old, but his blood runs through my instrument and his song is in my soul. My life has been a poor attempt to imitate the man. I'm just a living legacy to the leader of the band. So at various times in my life, I just want to you know, devote myself to a cause, just lose myself in a cause, just like the, you know, I'm Dennis Prager's number one customer. I'm Dennis Prager's number one fan. Or, you know, some other you know, slim hook I just, you know, just absurdly attached to, you know, devote all my resources to, to try to, you know, bring purpose and meaning and, and some sense of normality to my life. And it just makes the, the loneliness and the ache and the, and the pain and the dysfunction, you know, go away. And I can kind of, you know, get rid of my unwanted self and just, you know, embrace that, you know, hey, I'm just a, a follower of the, the leader of the band. But that doesn't last for long. Right? That, that doesn't work out. So I've had the opportunity to rescue people at times. It's been absolutely intoxicating. You know, this, this woman who was living off her sister's couch and, you know, sleeping in her office at the Los Angeles Press Club. And, you know, I got to, you know, bring her home and take her out. And she was just devoted to me. And I kind of got to feel like I was rescuing her. But that intoxicating effect of rescuing people, you know, becoming a Captain Saver ho, it doesn't, doesn't last long. It doesn't really get it done. So I'm, I'm kind of introspective right now because I just got in my, my monthly Amazon subscribe and save delivery. So I got about $600 worth of goods. But I'm starting to realize that no matter how much creamy chocolate Soylent I buy, it's never enough to fill that hole in my soul. Like even with the strawberry flavors, there are just so many amazing flavors of Soylent. And it's just so good for you. It's got the 36 grams of carbs, but 20 grams of protein and 24 grams of, of fat, just like a really well-balanced meal right here. But there's not enough soylent in the world to fill the hole in my soul. There, I mean, I can keep following gurus and devoting myself to gurus and cults, but in the end, I'm always going to come back to myself. And so I, I've not found great benefit from absurdly pursuing after goals, moderate goals, right? Goals in moderation. Yeah, that's great. I graduated from Alexander Technique Training School, right? That was, that was a goal. I did it. I feel good about it. That helped my life. But my experience is goals just narrow my focus. They distract me from the things I really need to be working on. I, I cut corners in, in pursuit of goals. So I, I prefer the bittersweet symphony of trying to create a life where I respect the various segments of my life from taking that cold shower at 3 a.m. to doing my exercises, listening to those podcasts, to doing the meditation, doing the positional release exercises, to writing some blog posts, to you know digging up old shows from the past that are not online and uploading them. Oh, one, of the, one of the most important books I ever read was uh, Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. And he makes the point that meaning is not a question that we la ask life, but, but the meaning of life is a question that life is continually asking us. Victor so. Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning is one of the most important books of our time. But the problem is most Americans don't even seem to know that it exists. Well, I read it. Yes, I wanted to be Julie. I wanted to be Dennis Prager's protege. I wanted to be his number one fan. Yeah. But I mean, not just with Dennis Prager, I've just you know, hopelessly devoted me, myself to, you know, all sorts of gurus and teachers. Uh, I'm just a fanboy at heart. Recently, it is a fascinating read with so many gems of wisdom. And today I'm going to tell you the three biggest takeaways that I have. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. Excellent. Whoa, whoa. Hey, is this music going to get me in trouble? I feel like it's going to get me in trouble with YouTube.
I mean, I, I don't have the special protective qualities that Salem Broadcasting does. Wasn't always this way in my life. I actually didn't like to read for most of my life. But when I graduated from college about a year ago, I decided to enter the second stage of education where I reread all of the important books that I once thought were boring. Well, one of those books was Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. I'll put a little asterisk next to this, though, because I actually wasn't assigned this book. And I sort of on the periphery knew about it. I didn't know that Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. I just thought it was a dude who was writing a book about meaning. But I decided to pick it up and read it recently. Super fast read. It took me two days. It's about 180 pages, big font, very palatable and easily understandable. And let me tell you, I think this book changed my life. You can read this book in 90 minutes, maybe two hours. Viktor Frankl is a name that all of us in America should know about. And just anecdotally, over the past two weeks, I've been going around in my life and asking some people who uh, I know across all different age spectrums if they are aware of this book and of Viktor Frankl. And many of them say, like an earlier Julie Hartman, that they have no idea who he is. So my so I, I like Julie. She's not very effective speaking one-on-one -on -one to the camera, right? She's much more effective talking to someone else like, like me, right? I'm, I'm much more at home, much more intimate, much you know, more effective talking to someone rather than talking just me one-on-one -on -one to the camera. So she's still you know, qu quite awkward talking one-on-one. -on -one. So you'll notice with her, her views, her, her views are about the same as mine when, when she just talks one-on-one -on -one to the camera. Now, the blokes behind If Books Could Kill, these are two very skilled communicators, very, two very intelligent people, and they provide a good roadmap for doing a great podcast, right? These blokes are on the left. Yeah, I don't agree with them on many issues, but they are prepared. They're energetic. They, they edit what they do. You know, they only release, you know, quality shows. And if you're looking for someone to emulate on how to produce a high-quality podcast, this is... If books could kill, here they're talking about the famous book Nudge. So the whole thing of their podcast is that they analyze airport bestsellers and how they destroy your mind. Find what are essentially psychological principles, right? This is the kind of thing that was in psych textbooks when I was majoring in that in college as economics principles, right. right? As something that takes on the same kind of legitimacy as like, you know, GDP figures or like the much more quantitative work that economists are traditionally doing. Mm -hmm. So David mm -hmm. Gall has mostly looked into this loss aversion thing. He says in one of his papers, he says, there's no general cognitive bias that leads people to avoid losses more vigorously than to pursue gains. Price increases do not impact consumer behavior more than price decreases. Messages that frame an appeal in terms of a loss are no more persuasive than messages that frame an appeal in terms of a gain. It is true that big financial losses can be more impactful than big financial gains, but this is not a cognitive bias that requires a loss aversion explanation. If losing $10,000 means giving up the roof over your head, whereas gaining $10,000 means going on an extra vacation, it is perfectly rational to be more concerned with the loss than the gain. Right, Likewise, right. there are other situations where losses are more consequential than gains, but these require specific explanations, not blanket statements about a loss aversion bias. This is why pop science sucks, kind of, right? <laughs> the appeal of pop science is this like general sense that you are now one of the smart ones with the secret knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, of course not, right? Yeah. Like, you have to think about that for a second. Of course you're not. You're yeah. just some guy who's reading a book. Right. It's just a way in which these types of books are just ego padding for like the formerly gifted children who are no longer <laughs> remarkable. What David Gall told me was like all of these concepts, right? Which are just psych concepts are just, they apply in some cases mm -hmm. and do not apply in other cases. Yeah. <laughs> like everything fucking else. It's like sometimes loss aversion is an interesting rubric to use to understand human behavior. Sometimes it's not. And it's not always clear in advance <laughs> yeah. whether yeah. it's going to be useful. But it's the, it's the aesthetic of counterintuitiveness right. that people find so appealing in this shit. This is a very good point because what this book is like pretending to be doing is like we're pushing back against the overconfident predictions of these fucking economists who think that we're mm -hmm. all rational actors, right? But actually, we can make overconfident predictions about people behaving irrationally. Right, right, right. They're reproducing the central error. They're just reproducing it in like follow our rules, not their rules. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I think that the mm, God, I, I have a half formed thought about this. You could just say, Mike, you're right and very handsome. You're correct. <laughs> Everyone likes you. All right. Yeah. yeah. Just why don't you record me saying that in various tones, <laughs> and then we can just. I'll just have a soundboard. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be like a little John soundboard. Give it enough time, you won't need a podcast co-host. <laughs> that's what I'm working toward. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Part two of the book, this is like the middle third of the book, is all about social influence. So one of the main ways that we are predictably irrational. Okay, so this is a problem that I notice a lot of non-Jews have more than, than Jews, but it is a serious problem. Uh, a lot of non-Jews, particularly those influenced by Christianity, put a, a great premium on a misunderstanding of humility. So I, I notice a lot of non-Jews, particularly from Christian backgrounds, 
it's really important to them that they don't have any sense that they are better than average in any area. And that's not humility. Humility simply means accepting reality. So I may be in the top 5% with regard to verbal fluency or verbal IQ or writing ability. Okay, it is not unhumble of me to accept that, you know, that's, that's a strong possibility. At, at the same time, I'm probably in the bottom, you know, 10% on all sorts of other parts of life. So you're not unhumble recognizing that you have certain gifts. Like if you're a painter, you should be spending your time painting. If you're a driller, you know, spend your time drilling. If you're an amazing uh, business administrator, you know, spend your time administrating. If you're, you're a profound probing reader, you know, spend your time reading, like recognize what you do best. So don't run away from taking an IQ test. You know, don't run away from your gifts. You know, don't be afraid of reality and recognizing that you are better in some things and worse than normal in other things. Like we all have special gifts, right? Different people have, have different gifts. And it's this crazy self-destructive impulse I notice among some people influenced by Christianity that they don't want to face up to their gifts. Right? They, they don't want to face up to that they are above average in intelligence, that they are above average in their you know, ability to do mathematics, that they are above average in their work capabilities. Right? It, it's, not, it's not humble, and you're not doing the world or yourself any favors to run away from reality, run away from who you are, and to recognize different people have different gifts, and you have different gifts than other people. And just because, say, you might be in the top 1% in some parts of life, you know, it doesn't mean overall you're just a superior person. You can then look down on other people and treat them like trash. But I think a mature person who wants to live in reality recognizes, hey, in this area, I'm in the top 10% approximately. In this area, I'm in the top 1%. In this area, I'm in the top 20%. In this area, I'm well below average. In this area, I'm well below average. I really struggle in this area. I feel like, you know, 90% of the people I know are far superior to me in in this area. So like if you've got you've got a gift, you know, pursue it. Uh don't don't flee from recognition of reality. And when you're doing, you know, you're starting to pursue your gifts, right? There's going to be humiliation that comes along as you're in unexpected circumstances. So if you're living in delusion, you're going to get humiliated. But I'm talking about a delusion that directly leads to your humiliation. So if you get out there and try new things, you're also going to get humiliated. I don't spend a lot of time in bars or sports bars. And if I go to a sports bar, I go to a bar. Uh, if I go dancing, these are things that are very unfamiliar to me. And so I'm going to have a lot of humiliation, but that's the humiliation from getting some, some growth in pushing myself to do things that I'm not used to doing. That's not the same as humiliation because I'm completely out of touch with reality that, you know, I think that my podcast or my show or my, writing ability or my reading ability or my intelligence is just, you know, so much greater than uh, other people, you know, then if your if your delusion directly leads to humiliation, you know that you're, you know, out of touch with reality and the humiliation was salutary, you know, it wakes you up to something that's going on. On the other hand, if you start doing things that are new and unexpected, uh, like dancing, right? Dancing is really awkward for me because I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist where dancing is a sin. And so I only you know, started to get into dancing just a teeny weeny bit after about age 16. But I had such strong imprinting from my childhood that dancing is a sin. I, I, it takes a lot for me to kind of overcome that imprinting. And I'm you know, very likely to make a complete fool of myself. Uh, so too with singing, right? I've had so many people tell me that you know, I'm a terrible singer, uh, particularly people close to me, uh, family members, that that's just like imprinted in my soul of my psyche. In reality, you know, my ability to sing is probably average, right? I, I don't have to be squeamish and, and shy and, you know, retiring and dread, you know, any, any, you know, opportunity that comes along to sing. So I think it's, it's just sad when people flee from recognizing or investigating where their true gifts lie. Right? Don't be afraid of being extraordinary. Don't be afraid of you know, finding out that you're extraordinary in some things and then pursuing your extraordinary abilities to, to the max. That's how you can best serve other people, best, you know, best serve 
you know, potential best serve God instead of, you know, trying to flee from reality. Like reality is only reality 100% of the time. Reality always wins. If the reality is you're excellent in something, you know, get out there and be excellent in it. Is we're subject to all kinds of conformity bias. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the study where it was like a bunch of people in a room and there's an optical illusion where like one line is very obviously longer than the other line and you're in a room with like six other people and they're like, they're the same length. They're the same length. Have I listened to the audible version of Tom Wolfe's Bonfire of the Vanities? I have listened to an audio version. I think Black, Blackburn Books or Black something, Blackstone Books. So if that's the same as the audible version, I'm not sure. Often there, there are multiple. I think there are like three different versions of George Eliot's Middlemarsh on audible. So I, I'm not sure. So I heard the Blackstone version, which was recorded simultaneously with the, with the Tom Wolfe book coming out. What was it? 1987 or so. But maybe it's uh, worth buying. I find it uh, comforting listening to Tom Wolfe books, just letting them play all night. Right? My Mine's a dangerous neighborhood. I don't want to enter alone. So I just leave Audible books running all night. The last two weeks, I've just been listening to the book Reclaiming Hin History, Vincent Bugliosi's Demolition of Various Conspiracy Theories about the John F. Kennedy assassination. So I've just been leaving that playing all night. Prior to that, I've mainly been listening to books on World War II. Let them play all night. And then by the time it gets to you, you're like, uh, they're the same length, even though you know that's not true. I'm not familiar with the study, okay. but I would absolutely pretend to think they were the same length, so I understand it. So yeah. to illustrate this point, this, this goes through a couple chapters, but the, the three main examples that he uses, first is a grad student. There's a grad student in the same department as Richard Thaler, and he needs to finish his PhD, and he knows he needs to finish his PhD. He's not a full professor until he finishes his PhD, but he just can't get the gumption to do it. And he's missing out on like retirement matching benefits, which is worth something like $10,000 a year. Okay. Really big monetary incentive for him to finish his PhD, and yet he can't mm -hmm. do it. But then Richard Thaler comes up with this innovative idea. He says, why don't you write me a bunch of checks? and post date them. So like March 1st, April 1st, May 1st. And if you don't give me a chapter of your PhD every month, I will cash the checks. You will be paying me. And so within six months, this grad student is able to finish his PhD. Yeah, because he, ha he has a reverse job. Yeah. <laughs> the, whole, the whole reason they joined, they went to grad school was to avoid having a job, and yet he's been tricked into sort of having one. We then get a genuinely pretty interesting example of a tax compliance experiment in Minnesota, which I'm going to send to you. Okay. In the context of tax compliance, a real-world experiment conducted by officials in Minnesota produced big changes in behavior. Groups of taxpayers were given four kinds of information. Some were told that their taxes went to various good works, including education, police protection, okay, and fire protection. Let's, uh, I can already tell you that one didn't work. Uh, <laughs> Others were threatened on, with on, information let's... about the risk of punishment. Let's see if I can get uh, Elliot Blatt onto the show. I'm using uh, Restream. I've never never used Restream before, but uh, Elliot, can you hear me, bro? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, beautiful, bro. What's going down? <clears throat> oh, you know, just a grind. Here, I have to shut off the other, uh, have to shut off the other one. One sec. Good to hear from our old okay. friend, Elliot Blatt. Yes, sir. Yeah, a long time no talk, man. A long time. Uh, yeah, I was I was picking up on your uh, physical fitness thing when I was in the car, and um, it, it's just weird getting older and feeling that you just <laughs> you're never gonna like get your youth back, but you just kind of want to stem the tide. You know, you want to stem the outgoing tide, and uh, like I couldn't imagine doing a pull up. Yeah. So I mean. But yeah, we're I trying have... them in front of three teenage girls who are like giggling at you. Yeah. And that's weird. Like I also recently had that experience of being mocked. <laughs> <laughs> Adolescent girls. <laughs> and then they it all went up and tried to imitate me, but none of they, they were like boosting each other up to try to accomplish yeah. a pull up. Yeah. But I almost got in a fight with like three like 18 year old girls youths youth <laughs> uh uh these were um these were european ancestry excellent <laughs> wow well, why did you why did you stop fighting bro well uh, it's kind of an amusing story like uh i'm you know i'm out on the tanning deck you know this roof of this beach house you know and it's usually a very sedate high IQ sort of gathering place, you know? And, but today th these three girls had somehow learned about it. They Googled and found this little, very out of the way beach and they made their way down there. And then they started playing the radio at like a very 
not the radio, they were, they were playing their phone or whatever at a pretty high volume, you know, and um, they were playing rap, you know, which is not exactly my favorite genre of music, you know, which you might, you might, you might have guessed. Yeah. And like, <clears throat> of course, you know, my blood is just slow, <coughs> slowly starting to boil, you know, and, but I didn't like take the initiative and tell him to turn it down. But there was this, um, so two of the girls were situated together and there was a third that was a, there was a, that was a friend of theirs that was situated away from them. So one of them yells over to the other, do you want me to turn this down? And then I said, <laughs> I just saw an opening and I saw my opportunity. I said, yes, I think we'd all appreciate that. <laughs> and my, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my tone of voice sort of did suggest a bit of annoyance, you know, but she wasn't talking to me. She's like, I wasn't talking to you, you know? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it would be really respectful to everyone here if you would just keep your music at a, at a moderate level, you know? And then, you know, she's like, you know, oh, shut up and blah, blah, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, screamy nonsense and, um, and then um, and the whole thing kept, she kept, they kept wanting to escalate the, the argument, you know, take it further than it needed to be, you know, rather than just simply turning it down, they wanted to sort of teach me a lesson. <laughs> they were just berating me. Now, bear in mind, all of them were wearing these thongs, right? You know, this, this trait now, these girls don't wear simply bathing suits, but they just showed these little thin, these wefer thin little um, bathing suits, you know, just, they're were effectively they new. How, how, how attractive were they? They, they were, they were solid. They were solid. Seven up, seven and above, you wow. know, not, not, like seven, seven and a half ish, you know? Okay. But they were, they were barely legal. Were, yeah. You know, it was a very morally compromising uh, situation. So <clears throat> I'm like, oh God. Uh, and then they're like, I keep trying to like just tone the whole thing down, you know, speaking in civil tones. I didn't want, I felt like I'm twice their age plus, you know, I'm like three times their so, age. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quite possibly. And I'm like, there's no dignified way out of this situation right now. <laughs> when you've got three adolescent girls screaming at you, there's no way that you look good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, so they're screaming at me and screaming at them. And, you know, I'm not screaming at them. I'm just saying, just this could all end right now. You don't, we don't need to do this argument so forth. So this is going on for what seemed like an eternity, but it was probably only like five minutes maximum. <coughs> and then um, this woman, so part of the high IQ group that was sort of on the other side of the building, sort of started to pick up on what's going on. And this woman who I think is a school teacher uh, came over to sort of diffuse the situation, right? Like, I, now I feel like a child, you know? Yeah. <laughs> this, <laughs> and she's like, what's going on here? Can I just talk to both of you individually? You know, so she separates us into groups and we were talking. And then, so they talk to the girls first and then I, she, <laughs> they come to me and I'm playing along and I'm like, I just wanted some quiet. I, I, you know, she, I asked them to turn it down, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, I'm not going to be browbeaten by these retards. <laughs> so I used the, <laughs> I called them retards. <laughs> and now that literally to this woman, you would have thought that I had just like taken out a, a, a handgun <laughs> at that point. The teacher, <laughs> the older woman was mortified by the fact that I use this term. She like physically just started backing away from me, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it's so hard to describe, you know, and then, uh, but then I said, I said, then she stopped talking to me and blah, blah. And then the whole thing just finally kind of fizzled out, you know, but um, it, it's just so weird. This is why I don't like to deal with people. Look, I don't know how to manage like basic human relations, you know? So you're not going to become a big brother to some teenage girls? Uh, no, 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 no. 
Yeah. And so I ended up calling one of them Twerky Booty, <laughs> which I thought was pretty, pretty good improvisation. You know, did you five. get uh, phone numbers? No, bro. No, bro. And uh, okay. where did they go to school? I, you know, they, I think they were, they sound like, you know, some sort of local San Francisco high school, I imagine. Public and they school. talked about their, I would imagine so. They were talking about their jobs at Cheesecake Factory and stuff. You know, they weren't, they weren't that bright, but. Were they religious? Uh, I, I don't know. I doubt it. And what do you think their IQs were? What? Um, I would say 90. Oh, wow. So they weren't 100 material, right? Yeah. Just and and how close just, physically did you come to them? Uh, about, about five or six feet. Okay. I kept a very, very respectful distance, you know, and, uh, and you went, you went rubbing yourself. No, no, no. I said, what would Luke do? And I said, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And were they Eastern European? Is that what you said? No, 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 no. They were like, I mean, you know, full, full European of, though. Yeah. European American of some sort. Yeah. I mean, okay. I don't know. It's, they were white. Luke. What can I say? You know, but they okay. all had all this, you know, bleached hair and all this shit, you know, it's all, and all the makeup and shit. It's just, just complicated visual stimuli that they're putting forward. <clears throat> but anyway, so I don't know. We got on this particular topic. Um, oh yes. Being mocked by uh, young girls. So it was very humiliating, you know, um, it's like getting in a fight with a homeless person. Like, did they, did they call you any names? Oh, they called me a, a, you know, a fucking white man, excuse my language and all that. They sort of kind of have all the woke vocabulary. Did they call you a pedo? No, they didn't cross that Rubicon, no. Um, so anyway. So if you had to do it all over again, how would you have handled it now that you've, you've had, the, you know, time to, to climb the mountain of wisdom? You know what I would have done? I would have just, I would have actually just screamed at them to turn it down and let's let the chips fall where they may. Because I don't think, I think my trying to reason with them actually was interpreted as weakness. I should have taken command, right? Just you mean you should them. have just like seized them and shaken them? Yeah, yeah. Just all three of them, just gather them up. Them. Just gather them up and <laughs> shaken know. them. Yeah. All at once. <laughs> Slap them. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you're out there winning friends, winning friends, influencing people. Yeah. Yeah. But let's talk about, so anyway, this physical, um, exercise kit you're on and mm -hmm. I, I'm on, I'm trying to get on and my, my, my exercise regimes are always, um, they're always thwarted by something, you know? Um, like, laziness. You know, it's not laziness. It's like physical pain now. It's okay. like, you know, I told you I was, uh, I, I, I was, I went out to try and walk 10 miles. I set a goal of walking 10 miles and, you know, I have this loop. It's about a mile and a quarter. So I was going to do so many laps of this loop, uh, to hopefully get to 10 miles. And I got to six miles. And my feet were just screaming in pain, like pain, like I oh, never understood foot pain until this. It was like, uh, it's just that dull driving pain you get, you know, with, I don't know if you get that. So, yeah. Was it, was it plantar fasciitis? Do you know what particular foot pain it I was? Think that, I think that what it was, it was sort of like, uh, it was mainly around the ball in the front part of my foot. Do you feel it first thing in the morning? When you get up no. and walk to the bathroom? No, no it's okay. Only, it's only after excessive, uh, okay. you know, after a considerable period of, of exercise. And and I gave you like 10, 10 solutions. Did you, what, what did you, yeah, what well, did you end well, up doing for it? Well, okay. So I, I identified a pair of shoes I want to buy, um, but they're $165. And I'm like, I, I've never paid, I've never paid more than $70 for a pair of shoes. And that was you once. can't put a price on comfort and self-care bro i know but i have this aesthetic uh temperament puritan, puritan. Wouldn't, yeah 
a, a, Jew, would not, a Jew would not think this way. This no, yeah, no, that's side. Yeah, so I'm trying to get over it. I'm like, I'm worth it, right? You yeah, know, I can pay 165 dollars, and that's even before shipping and tax and everything. You know, hmm. like for a pair of shoes, it just I don't know. I'm sort of stuck like 10 years ago. I see all these pricings. I remember I could go out to lunch for like $8. I could have like a full <laughs> salad of lunch for $8. And now, you know, I'm lucky to get out of there for t- under 20 bucks. It's ridiculous, Luke. So yeah, I'm a tightwad. At the end of the day, I'm a tightwad. But I am going to pull the trigger. I got a raise, by the way. So, oh, muzzle top. Thank you, bro. Thank you. I felt good. My, my work's being appreciated. So I feel like I could treat myself. So I am going to pull the trigger on these shoes. But then... You research all the shoes and there's so many different shoes out there. And then you get lost in this. Once you've committed to spending that amount of money on a pair of shoes, you don't want to make a mistake. You want to get the best, you know? So there's all this comparison shopping and stuff like that, which. What about a stationary bike? So that, so it takes that enormous load off your feet. I mean, how how much do you weigh? Uh, I don't even want to, I can't admit it, bro. It's too painful. 240? 240? No, not that bad, bro. Come 230. On. No, 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 no. Come Look, when I was in high school, I was like 130 pounds. I was on the cycling team. Like, I was fit, right? So, like, I used to stress. If I got to 132 pounds, I felt fat in high school, you know? Uh, but now I'm far, far heavier than that, bro, and it's, it hurts me. Are you six foot? <laughs> so, but hold on. So the point is, if I start this exercise regime, it would just be sort of like I'd be gritting it out. I'd be, yeah, I would, I would just be grinding, you know, it would just yeah. be uh, another discipline, you know? Yeah. And I don't know if that's like a healthy psychology to have. No, that's you why know? I'm not a big fan of goals. What's much better is to have a bittersweet symphony going on. Yeah. You know, whether yeah. the different parts of your life work together. So goals just narrow your focus. Like you had the goal of walking 10 miles, but you're doing yeah. p- perhaps tremendous damage to your feet. And so by, by emphasizing the goal of w- w- walking 10 miles, you you may very well have been doing yourself far more harm th- than good. And so too, like if people who have the goal of lifting a certain amount of weight, they might cheat in how they do it and do damage to themselves. So yes. I'm not a big fan of goals, like mild to moderate goals. Yeah, but I'm not a big fan of putting a premium on goals because of the very situation that you described. So I think you you join me and it's much better trying to build a life that's a symphony where everything's just working together. If you can't walk, then you, you do, you know, other physical activity and you you want a life where all the different components kind of work together like a symphony. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, this is why I'm such a big advocate for you know, country life and farming and things where exercise is just naturally part of your day rather than this weird sort of block of time that you carve out and devote yourself to. I mean, that's an integrated life, you know, where there's hard work, but it's not like nine to five hard work. You know, it's just periods, short ish, two, three hour blocks of hard work. And then it's sort of balanced out by other types of work or other types of activities that are physical. I think that's like the natural way to live, but our, our sort of nine to five desk bound life. Has, you can has make has a been. beautiful symphony out of your nine to five desk bound life, bro. Well, I, I, I thought about the stationary bike, but I'm on the third floor and I think that that pedaling that just the rumbling of the no machine. there's no rumble there's no no bro there's there's no rumble no. there's no it nobody else hears it feels it it's uh an, and i only spent like 150 dollars on the stationary bike so it's not like it's some expensive piece of machinery no one else feels it no one else is affected by it when i get on my yeah. stationary bike you know what i'll reconsider that uh i bought a regular bike i got a great mountain bike at a yard sale uh um, but I, I just never seem to actually get on it. And, uh, and also it's more dangerous, uh, uh, you know, our, our age, you fall off from Paul Gottfried was hospitalized and, you know, laid up for, for weeks. So how many people do we know who had biking accidents and been laid up for, for weeks, if, if not killed by it? 
So it, it's, you know, it's increasingly dangerous when you get to our age and older, particularly in the, in the city. Yeah, speaking of that, you know, I, I worked for this company and my, my, one of my many managers is an avid mountain biker. And he was also ethnically Chinese and his um, English wasn't particularly good to start with. And then he fell off his mountain bike and just knocked like four of his front teeth out, you know? Yeah. And then when he would talk, he would just sound completely retarded. Blah, 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 blah. He was completely unintelligible. So, um, I, I know a guy imagine, who's imagine really. That. His what, life, what was that wait, wait, in your wait, live streaming career? Wait, wait, wait. Like, yeah, yeah. So I know this guy whose life was martial arts. He got punched in the throat and he can only speak in a whisper for the rest of his life. Was it worth it, bro? Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, exactly. And then I got another story about the shortcomings of goals. There was this one bloke, he wanted to devote his life to ha having a family and, and raising kids. And then he, he caught one of my shows where I pointed out the parents really don't make that much of a difference in their killed kids' outcomes, that there's no parenting style that's statistically shown to make a difference. Like he had all these ideas on how he wanted to raise his kids and how they were just going to be, you know, transformational. You know, so he went and read a whole bunch of academic studies and, you know, realized that I was basically correct that the, the, the nurture assumption is basically faulty, that we're largely the, the product of our genes plus our, our peer group. So that was like his, you know, number one goal and dream, you know, disappeared upon examination. So a lot of people develop, you know, goals that they want to pursue to an absurd degree, but upon, you know, any sort of critical examination, the, the goal just falls apart. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I knew a guy, um, who he joined like a uh, a religious cult, I guess it would be. Um, and he just seemed to lose all of his goals. And yeah. I said, well, what are you going to do? And he's like, well, wherever God puts me, you know, <laughs> he had just completely let off the whole notion of goals and so forth. And I found that terrifying when he said that. I really, I like goals. Goals, like, uh, goals give me a certain zest, you know? They make life, I, I, there's been periods when I had no goals and I felt completely adrift. And I don't like that feeling. Yeah, what, what about the downside of goals in that it narrows your focus and it tempts you to cheat, to achieve your goals, to, to shortchange yourself in other areas? Yeah. Yeah. Have you experienced that? Um, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, I have goals, right? But I also have a sense of authenticity. Like, why get something and have it be authentic, inauthentic? I think that I don't, I, I, I would hate the, the, the imposter feeling, you know? And it seems like cheating or taking a shortcut would always leave you this stale residue of, a, of a, an imposter feeling. It's a big, it's a big term up here, you know, the, the imposter syndrome. You hear, hear that? Yeah. And, a lot of women talk about it. Right, right. And it's like a really big, it's like women in tech, especially. Yeah. And they talk about it and they have, you know, workshops on it and the truth is, is that they just don't like tech, but tech is where the prestige is. And so they go there because they want the prestige and they can't admit that to themselves. So there's this massive cognitive dissonance. Um, so anyway, no, I, I don't feel like, uh, shortcuts, that was something like, I really, it's a lesson I learned really early and I really took to heart, which is that there are no shortcuts, right? You have to, mm -hmm. if you want to do something, you have to build the foundation and put it up, you know, brick by brick. And if you skimp on any of the uh, foundational pieces, you're just going to pay for it later. It's all going to come crashing down. So where do you get the power to lead a life that's a symphony so that you're eating right? You're not overeating. You're not over drinking. You're not over consuming YouTube. You're 
you're exercising appropriately in consonance with what's in your body's best interest. You're getting appropriate amounts of social interaction. You are working productively. Where do you get the power to create a life that's a symphony, bro? Uh, well, I don't really have that. I have a general direction like I like to go in, <clears throat> but um, my best played plans are often torn asunder. So, um, but I'll tell you what I do, how I figure things. I figured everything from sleep. So how did I sleep last night? And the how answer did you is, sleep? well, Beautiful. Uh, poorly last night, oh. uh, because I messed up my meals and I stopped at like this roadside Mexican restaurant that just completely just malformed my uh, digestion. So it was a long night, bro. And it's like anytime I can, if, if I'm not taken off my routine, I, I can function very well. But as soon as my routine is disrupted, uh, it takes me like three days to recover. So my power, I guess, would come from my routine. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, what do you do? How, how often do you feel lonely? I don't feel lonely, Luke. But I am a loner. <laughs> I feel bad that I don't feel lonely, but when I'm with people, I can't wait to get. I can't wait to be by myself. <laughs> so, if I were to tell you overnight scenes, dinner and wine, Saturday girls, I was never in love, never had the time in my hustle and hurry world, laughing myself to sleep, waking up lonely. I needed someone to hold me. Such a crazy old town. It can drag you down till you run out of dreams. So you party all night to the music and lights, but you don't know what happiness means. I was dancing in the dark with strangers, no love around me, when suddenly you found me. Oh, oh girl, you're every woman in the world to me. That, that doesn't mean anything to you. That doesn't resonate with you. Luke, talking to myself and feeling old, sometimes I'd like to quit. Neither, nothing ever seems to fit. Yeah. Hanging around, nothing to do but frown. Yeah. Rainy, Rainy days, days and Mondays, Mondays always bring me down. Always get me down. Well said, bro. Well said. So I, I would watch a lot of Karen Carpenter appreciation videos. This is a whole YouTube genre. Yes. I, she's amazing. Like, I always feel like she's singing directly to me. Yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. She died young, too. It's a tragic story. How, how many of you watch? Of these appreciation videos? Yeah. At least a dozen. At least a dozen. By yeah. What have you learned? I learned, well, a lot of, uh, she just had a natural talent. Like there is that thing. There is such thing as, she seemed to have a very 